take a start now. Um, I discussed the mechanism of the Bainite transformation in the last lecture and we are going to focus today on applying the theory that we have learnt towards designing uh, totally different kinds of steels for structural applications. So, just to go through uh, some revision, uh, I pointed out that by drawing the free energy surfaces of ferrite and austenite, we can identify the locus of points where austenite and ferrite of the same chemical composition have exactly the same free energy and that is uh, the T0 curve which is not normally plotted on a phase diagram because it is not an equilibrium feature. Basically, it tells you that if the carbon concentration of the austenite exceeds the T0 curve, it is impossible to get diffusionless transformation. And uh, we decided that bainite forms without any diffusion because if you conduct isothermal transformation and imagine that a plate of bainite uh, in a steel which has a composition X bar, uh, if a plate of bainite forms like martensite, because of the temperature at which it is forming, uh, you will partition carbon into the austenite, the austenite becomes richer in carbon and this process can only continue until you hit the T0 curve. Uh, if carbon uh, was never supersaturated in the ferrite, then it would continue until the equilibrium phase boundary which is the A3 phase boundary. All right? The dashes simply imply that we are taking account of strain energy due to transformation. Okay, everyone happy with this? Okay. And you can see from this diagram also that if I transform isothermally at a higher temperature, then I will get less bainite. Okay. So, this is important. Uh, and we verified experimentally that the reaction stops at the T0 curve. Uh, and there were consequences of all this. Uh, for example, in the two kinds of bainite that we observe, we could predict uh, a transition from uh, you know precipitation free bainite ferrite plates to ferrite plates containing precipitates and in other words the upper to lower bainite transition and the growth rates that we record are many orders of magnitude greater than would be permitted by carbon diffusion during growth. Okay? So, that is a summary of what we did in the last lecture and uh, this this is a nice uh, image telling you exactly what happens during the bainite transformation. Now, the problem from a mechanical property point of view is that the cementite particles that we see are not good for toughness. In particular, the cementite particles between the plates of bainite because when we are making strong steels, uh, you know, we have removed all the dirt that is in the steel like manganese sulphide particles and so forth. Uh, and when I say strong, I mean much more than a thousand megapascals. Uh, so, the cementite particles become the ones that nucleate voids or cleavage cracks. Right? So, cementite is a brittle feature in strong steels and we want to get rid of it. So, these are the typical cementite particles in bainitic steels we cannot control them because they form at the isothermal transformation temperature. So, we do not have the possibility of uh, as we have in tempering of martensite to control the size of the precipitates because we can alter the tempering time etcetera in the case of martensite. We cannot do that with bainite they form during the transformation. So, if you if you look at these impact transition curves are you familiar with Sharpie tests? So, you know you have a notch specimen because the notch introduces triaxiality of stress and therefore gives you the worst possible uh, combination to induce brittle failure, okay? a triaxial stress. Now, you can see that in the presence of carbides the toughness is very poor. So, when I say the toughness is very poor I mean two things one that the total energy absorbed is low, but it is also very important that the impact transition temperature that means, where you go from brittle to ductile should be below room temperature okay? and you can see that it is not, it is really high. You would not use such a steel in an engineering application. <coughs> so, how can I suppress the precipitation of cementite? 
Uh, you have to think back to cast ions. What alloying element changes, uh, say, a white cast iron which contains tons of cementite to a gray cast iron? Silicon content? Yeah, it's a silicon content. And the reason why silicon suppresses uh, the precipitation of cementite is that it has an almost zero solubility in the cementite. Okay? So, um, What we want to do is we want to stop the reaction at this point. In other words, any carbon that's partitioned into the austenite, we want it to stay there and stabilize the austenite. Austenite is a nice thing to have in the microstructure. It doesn't have a ductile brittle transition temperature, unlike, unlike ferrite. Okay? So if we add silicon, that ought to suppress the cementite. And here is an example of uh, to show you why uh, silicon suppresses cementite. So given that the solubility of silicon in cementite is virtually zero, you can't actually do thermodynamic measurements to show that you know, uh, it greatly increases the free energy of uh, cementite. Now when you can't do an experiment, uh, you can still do calculations and first principles calculations where you, know, you put a set of atoms and work out the lowest energy configuration of those atoms, you've come across this, right? Yeah, in, in one of the courses. So here is the unit cell of cementite. And if we simply substitute silicon for iron, then you can see that you dramatically increase the free energy of that phase, right? So for whatever reason, cementite does not like silicon. And that is the reason why adding a certain amount of silicon will suppress the precipitation of cementite. Okay? Now, from these first principles calculations, you can take these numbers and put them into phase diagram calculations and show that you know, the cementite phase field vanishes or decreases dramatically. Okay? Uh, so when you do not actually have any way of doing an experiment, first principles calculations come, come to the fore. So they are most useful when you can't actually do any experiments. Of course, these are done at zero Kelvin. So we then have to make some approximations to calculate a phase diagram at a higher temperature. Okay? Is everyone happy with that? Okay, so let's design a very simple uh, carbide-free alloy. Uh, we've added two weight percent of silicon to the steel so that when we form bainite, we will not actually get any cementite. And instead, the carbon that's partitioned remains in the austenite, and therefore it stabilizes the austenite to martensitic transformation on cooling to room temperature. Okay? So we should end up with a nice mixture of bainitic ferrite and austenite. Uh, we add a certain amount of manganese because we want to avoid the formation of ferrite or perlite. And the carbon is there for, for the strength. So it's a very, very simple steel. It's not normal. You know, a normal steel will contain 20 different alloying additions, but we want to prove a principle here. <coughs> Everyone happy with uh, this so far? Okay. So the silicon is added to suppress the cementite, the manganese to suppress the formation of high temperature transformations, reconstructive transformations and the carbon we need for, for strength. We are aiming for high strength steels. <coughs> okay, so the microstructure that we get is really beautiful. I've shown you this slide before. Um, we have these extremely fine platelets of bainitic ferrite separated by these regions of carbon enriched retained austenite. So this is like a composite microstructure and I can list the advantages of a microstructure like this. Okay, so let's list some of the properties that we expect uh, from this nice composite microstructure consisting of bainitic ferrite and carbon enriched retained austenite. Well, first of all, we have a fine mixture, fine mixture of bainitic ferrite and retained austenite. So this is our bainitic ferrite.
and retained austenite. And the retained austenite does not have a ductile brittle transition temperature. It's tough at all temperatures. So it does not have a ductile brittle transition temperature. So that's uh, an advantage. And the bainitic ferrite is relatively strong. Now, what do I mean by fine? Well, we've discussed this earlier that the platelets themselves are about a quarter of a micrometer in thickness, and it's the thickness which determines the mean free slip distance. Uh, secondly, we may actually get toughening when the austenite is induced to transform uh, under the influence of the stress field at a crack tip because that leads to an absorption of energy and hence uh, toughening. So transformation induced plasticity is the terminology that we use to explain the absorption of energy when austenite is induced to transform under the influence of a stress. Okay, and we'll deal with this uh, trip steels in more detail at some stage. So the gamma to alpha prime transformation absorbs energy and therefore the toughness is improved. Now, thirdly, uh, there is no cementite in the structure, Fe3C. And therefore, it is difficult to nucleate cracks or voids. So that should improve the toughness. And Number four, uh, the diffusivity of hydrogen in austenite is very low. Of hydrogen in gamma is very low. Therefore, it hinders the penetration of embrittling hydrogen into the steel. Therefore, hinders the penetration of embrittling hydrogen into the steel. And finally, uh, the amount of carbon inside the ferrite is very low because it's partitioned into the austenite. So the bainitic ferrite contains much lower carbon concentration than the average in the steel. Yeah, simply because it has partitioned into the remaining austenite. So carbon in ferrite tends to embrittle the ferrite. So this is also a good thing. So let's see now um, whether this leads to very good properties. But first, I'll summarize the, the advantages once again. So we have uh, apparently an ideal mixture of phases. Uh, so we have a fine structure, we have retained austenite which gives us a, a trip effect, uh, we have no ductile brittle transition associated with the austenite, so it, it acts like a composite material in which we have a tough phase and a strong phase. 
Uh, it's a barrier to hydrogen penetration into the steel. There's no cementite to nucleate voids or uh, cleavage cracks. And uh, I forgot to mention that we also have uh, very little carbon left in the ferrite. And you know that uh, carbon in martensite causes embrittlement, right? It makes it stronger but embrittles because um, of the tetragonal distortion of the lattice. Now here, the carbon, even though the average carbon concentration is just 0 0.4 weight percent, we are actually pushing it into the austenite where it stabilizes the austenite and is doing doing good <coughs> things. Yeah? So this is the cheapest way of producing austenite is to add carbon. Okay? Uh, whereas, uh, you know, if you use things like nickel and so on, as in austenitic stainless steels, that's quite expensive. <coughs> and when I talk about expense, I just mean in the context of steels where we want to produce huge quantities, right? Uh, you know, if you, if you make uh, a little bit of uh, carbon nanotube, that's hundreds of times more expensive than the same quantity of iron, right? So you have to think about cost in context, that if you just want to make a tiny, tiny thing, then you can afford very expensive materials. But if you want to make, you know, bridges and proper engineering, then you need to have material that's affordable. Okay, so let's look at the properties, okay? And when we look at the toughness, it's actually a disaster, right? You can see that, uh, you know, the ductile brittle transition temperature is way above room temperature, right? So there's no way this is any good and there's something wrong with our ideas about this ideal structure. When we look at the optical micrograph of that material, we see that there are large regions here of austenite that are untransformed. Okay? And it doesn't matter how long I hold it at the transformation temperature, they will not transform because of the T0 condition. Right? Now, why is that bad? Well, look at the scale over there, 50 micrometers. If that austenite trips, you will produce untempered martensite, which is 50 micrometers in size. And that is very brittle. Okay? So the thermodynamic condition T0 means that we are left with large quantities of austenite, not the nice, beautiful, thin films between the plates. They are fine. Okay? But this is like throwing a brick into the microstructure, a very fine microstructure, which is about 50 micrometers <coughs> in size. So apparently, there's nothing we can do about this because, you know, I. I can get rid of these large regions if I can promote more bainite to form. Okay. So let's look at uh, how we could resolve this situation. Okay? So I plotted here the T0 curve. X bar is the average concentration of carbon in our steel, which is 0 0.4 weight percent. <coughs> and uh, XT0 is simply the T0 carbon concentration. So if I apply the lever rule, to the T0 curve and assume that you know the ferrite contains zero carbon. Okay, so this is the carbon concentration of the ferrite. This is the carbon concentration of the austenite, it's XT0, and the average, then that gives me the volume fraction of bainite. Okay? And I want to increase that. Is there anything I can do? There are three things that I could do to increase the volume fraction of bainite. So Tell me those three things. Just from that very simple equation, okay? Decrease the average. Decrease x bar is one thing, because we are not going to lose strength. Uh, we are producing more of those fine platelets, okay? Uh, you know, you can always improve toughness by reducing strength, but that's not what we want to do. We want to make a high strength steel, okay? So decreasing x bar. What else? Uh, so that will make the ferrite brittle if we increase X alpha, okay? Decrease the temperature of the formation. Very good. Uh, decrease the transformation temperature. And what's the limit? Um, if I decrease the transformation temperature, X T0 increases, and therefore we will get more bainitic ferrite. 
Martin. Martin. Martin side. So yeah. So the MS temperature of the steel gives you the lowest, uh, lowest um, transformation temperature for bainite. And the third condition, uh, the third way in which we could do this. Is there any way I can change that red curve? Yeah, so it depends on the free energy curves of austenite and ferrite, right? That's right? So I could add other things which cause it to move to higher carbon concentration. Okay? Okay, so uh, we'll design two more steels, uh, one in which we reduce the average carbon concentration. And the second one, uh, we substitute manganese with nickel because nickel shifts the T0 curve to higher uh, carbon concentrations without changing the average carbon <coughs> concentration, right? So very simple equation and we are designing now two new steels to promote more bainite to form. And this is just to show you that you know, if I add nickel instead of manganese, then I shift the T0 curve to higher carbon concentrations. Okay. So these calculations. Why is that? Yeah. Because so I thought nickel is a gamma stabilizer, so surely it should lower. Yeah, yeah. So if you look relative to FEC, it's lowered. Oh, okay. But relative to manganese, which is a stronger gamma stabilizer, okay. Now, uh, you can uh, do these calculations routinely. You can download a computer program from my website to do that. Or if you look in the book that's recommended for this course, uh, there's a chapter right at the end uh, which has some simple calculations for working out these T0 curves. You don't need to go into them, but I'm just telling you it's not difficult to do T0 curve calculations. Okay, so we design uh, these two, uh, two steels and see what happens. So we reduce dramatically the blocks of austenite that, uh, that are apparent here. here. These are the blocks of austenite. When we look at the transmission electron uh, micrographs for the two new steels, we basically got rid of those blocks of austenite. Okay? We are left with these nice films of austenite between the plates of ferrite. And you know, without doing any empirical work, we've reduced the impact transition temperature for both of those new steels by 200 degrees centigrade to well below room temperature. Okay. So, you know, the phase transformation theory tells you how to get rid of those blocks of austenite. Therefore, you didn't need to mess about with composition, etc. You just do a simple calculation and you can reduce, uh, you can dramatically improve the toughness of the steel without compromising the strength. That's the important thing. So here, you know, the impact transition temperatures are below room temperature for these two steels. This is the original uh, 0.4 carbon, 3 manganese, 2 silicon steel. Here we've reduced the impact transition temperature well below room temperature. Okay. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so let's see uh, what we can make with such a steel because the strength level is about 1600 megapascals. Uh, what are these? Railway yeah, railway tracks. Now, railway tracks uh, conventionally are made from what kind of a microstructure, do you know? They've got to be hard, right? They're strong. High carbon steel, about 0 0.8 weight percent carbon steel. And what would you expect the structure to be? Uh, no, martensite would be too brittle at that concentration. So it's, you, it's perlite, all right? And what, what does perlite consist of? Cementite, ferrite. How, how are they distributed? I want you to say the wrong thing, okay? You've been told that these are alternating lamellae of cementite and ferrite, yeah? So that, that's not actually, um, when you look at a two-dimensional section, it looks like that. But actually, um, each colony of perlite is a bicrystal, 
right? Uh, so imagine that you have a cabbage uh, which represents the cementite, then the leaves of the cabbage are all connected, right? Uh, it's a single crystal of cementite. And then you put it into a bucket of water, the water is the single crystal of ferrite. It's only when you section that cabbage that you see uh, alternating layers, okay? Now, the reason why I'm emphasizing this is that the unit of fracture is the colony, all right? So you get an undeviated crack across the colony. You can increase the strength by refining the spacing between the leaves, but you don't improve the toughness. Okay, so conventional rails are strong and they serve us very well, but they are not tough. Okay. So supposing we made instead the rail out of this new, new structure, which is um, a mixture of bainitic ferrite and austenite, then we wouldn't have that problem. We would have the toughness as well as the hardness, the strength, etc. <laughs> and bear in mind that the sort of pain that a rail has to take is enormous. Okay? You've got metal wheels going over metal, right? And uh, if you look at uh, something called Hertzian theory, if you press onto a surface, you induce maximum shear stress under the surface. Okay? And every time a wheel goes over the rail, you've got a pulse, a very large pulse of stress under the surface. And then you build up fatigue damage, and then a spool comes off, and then you have an accident. Okay? And in addition, it's not simple rolling. You've also got sliding. Yeah? That means, uh, and there's no lubrication at all between a, a railway wheel and a rail. Right? So if you have sliding as well, you get a lot of wear. So we need the material to be wear resistant, <coughs> and rolling contact fatigue resistance, okay? So these are the stress pulses which arise every time a wheel goes over, over a rail. <coughs> so there is no material other than steel which can take this sort of pain, okay? <coughs> now, uh, the new, new structure beats uh, the politic rails and head hardened rails in terms of rolling contact fatigue. So these are tests uh, done on full scale in a laboratory at Poland um, where basically this structure doesn't fail in rolling contact fatigue. And in terms of wear resistance, look, look at this. This is a test track in the US where you know heavy trains go round and round. And on the left hand side you've got the head hardened politic rail on the right hand side you've got the new carbide free bainitic rail and this is the only material which reduces wear on the wheel as well now you know that in britain when we privatized uh, the rails one company owns the track and another one owns the rolling stock so if you improve the rail and you damage the wheels there's a problem right this is the only material which will reduce the wear on both the rail and the wheel. Now, how many of you have traveled in the Channel Tunnel? Yeah, to France. Okay, so you've gone over the rails that we invented. Uh, inside the Channel Tunnel, uh, we have this new rail installed. Now, normally, you can't see anything inside the tunnel, and, you know, the joke is that it's because it might be dripping water. But actually, it's a very nice place, very clean, and you've got the new bainitic rails installed. And you know, in order to in order to actually get a good feeling about steel, yeah, steel needs to be heavy. We don't need light materials for everything. It's only when you are moving around uh, in cars and planes that you need light material. But the vast majority of applications require strong and sturdy engineering. Just feel the weight of this, okay? You need this density, okay? To, to bear all that pain. So pa pass it around, and you don't need to go to the gym afterwards. <laughs> uh, this is a, 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 what's known as a torpedo car, which carries about 300 tons of molten steel uh, on, between uh, locations on a steel plant, and uh, it's traveling on that painitic rail. 
And if I plot uh, uh, properties from many different alloys, we are plotting fracture toughness there and uh, strength there, then QT means quenched and tempered uh, martensitic steels. My raging steels uh, are very expensive, very good steels, but very expensive because they contain huge quantities of uh, alloying additions. And this material meets meets the properties of my raging steels in terms of strength and toughness. Okay? So, what, what I want to <laughs> emphasize is that um, just very simple understanding of the atomic mechanisms of phase transformations helps you to reach your goal of designing new kinds of steels very quickly. Okay? So, when we do you know, lattice invariant deformations and invariant lines and so on, they actually have a purpose. Uh, they, they help you to understand how to design alloys. Okay? Okay, so don't leave without feeling the weight of that rail and I'll finish the lecture here. <laughs>